Sister Mary of the Cross, counted on but this as loss, humbling self from door to door, all for Jesus, aged This is the story of a little girl who all of her life yearned only to become little, very little. But it is also the story of a strong, tall woman, a spiritual giant of her time and of ours. This is the story of Saint Jean Jugon. She was born October 25th, 1792. 191 miles due west of Paris in the fishing village of Cancale, on the northern French coast where the English Channel meets the Celtic Sea. The Jugon family and all of the residents of Cancale knew a hard life, for they lived and died by the sea. In good times, Cancale was called the oyster capital of all Brittany. But all too often, Cancale was a grieving place when the cold Celtic sea and her monstrous storms claimed her toll of lives from among Cancal's seafarers. And so it was on a morning in April 1796 that four-year-old Jean's father went to sea in his boat, never to return. We don't know why the tragic events of life lead some people to irreconcilable despair, but others to unfathomable greatness. Despite the darkness of death, a light of faith shone in the Jugan household and in the surrounding community. And in that light, a child's heart grew and prospered in such virtue that it would one day reach out to thousands of men and women who in sundry ways were also victims of shipwreck along life's shore. In her youth, Jeanne Jugon was attracted to the spirituality of St. John Eudes, who had lived a century earlier in Normandy, France. As a young priest, St. John devoted his life to caring for the physical and spiritual needs of marginalized women. John Yude's spirituality permanently shaped Jean Jugon. As a young woman, she committed herself as a lay member of his society to help span the gap that separates the physically and spiritually poor 
from their God-given rights as his children. Jean was courted by a young man of Cancal, but when he asked for her hand in marriage, she said no. Later, her mother asked why she had refused a life of marital joy, and she said, God wants me for himself. He is keeping me for a work which is still unknown. This pivotal event in the life of Jean Jugand occurred in 1816, when she was 23 years old. Her life would more than double in years before she would begin to understand the prophetic meaning of her own words. Much more formation of the heart of young Jean Jugand was in store. And with those words of submission to God's will, God wants me for himself, a new phase of her equipping began. The time to leave Cancal had arrived. Take, oh, take me as I am. So In 1817, at the age of 24, Jean Jugan left her mother and her village to become a hospital nurse's maid in San Servan, a larger seafaring town eight miles away. Seven years later, now 31, she left her hospital work to become the personal maid of a wealthy single woman who had befriended her. The woman's name was Mademoiselle Lecoq. In this working friendship, Jean Judan learned the social graces of the wealthy, a mighty tool she would one day use in her begging for the poor. Eleven wonderful years of holy friendship passed. The two women made it their daily practice to visit the elderly and infirm near their home. But then, in 1835, God called Mademoiselle Lecoq to himself. Death of a loved one was again a crossroad in Jean Jugan's life. First her father, 
and now a dear friend. She was 42 years old. She was alone. She could either learn to fend for herself in some other way or listen to that still, small voice of the beloved within calling her to a work which was still unknown. The stage was set. God was calling her to become total gift of self for the other. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. Here he stands behind our walls, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattices. My lover speaks. He says to me, Arise, my beloved, my beautiful one, and come. The flowers bloom on the earth, the time to prune the vines has come, and the song of the dove is heard in the land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines in blossom put forth fragrance. Arise, my beloved, my beautiful one, and come. Arise, my beloved. The year was 1839. In the five years that had passed since the death of Mademoiselle Lecoq, Jean Jugan had moved into a second floor apartment with two other women who shared her commitment to the teachings of St. John Hughes. The three kept body and soul together through occasional part-time maid service to wealthy households. According to town records, that winter, 3,500 of San Servan's 10,000 residents were paupers. The majority of these were elderly widows and family members of lost seafarers. Many were homeless. There was no social safety net in that town or in all of France. If you were alone, elderly, and infirm in San Servan, you most likely would not survive the winter. One evening, 
at the age of 47, the fulfillment of St. John Dragon's prophecy began to unfold. By stepping through her door into the frigid, wintry blasts of the Celtic Sea and onto the streets of San Servan, Jean Jugan embarked upon a work that was unknown to the world, unknown even to herself, known only by God. The life of the Little Sisters of the Poor began. She was blind, ill, and elderly. She was alone in the winter of San Servan, alone in the winter of life. To Jean Jugan, she was Jesus Christ. Jean took Anne into her home and gave the woman her own bed. Jean moved into the attic. The action was uncomplicated and totally unnoticed by the world. Jean Jugan had simply given all she could to a person who could give nothing in return. And in that very little act of faith, a seed was planted in very fertile soil. That seed is called charism, a special gifting of the Holy Spirit that little apartment in San Servan was filled with God's special grace. Jean sought the approval of her companions before offering their companionship and their home to Anne. For it was to be the will and action of a community of believers. It wasn't long before they sought her approval, before they brought in another elderly woman. Together, the three servants of Christ cared for the two, but that was just the beginning. young working girl in need of the care and love of the little community of servants to the poor. Her name was Madeleine Bourge. Upon her recovery a few months later, Madeleine asked to join in the work of these three servants of Christ. Through the total giving of self by Jean Jugan and her companions, the Holy Spirit was conceiving a new order of women, a little band that now called themselves Servants of the Poor. As she neared the age of 50, Jean Jugan's prophetic words spoken 27 years earlier were becoming true. God was keeping her for himself for a work 
yet unknown. The work soon outgrew the confines of their small apartment. The four women and their guests moved to a new home just down the street. Jean devoted herself to begging. In a little way, Jean Gigan's work was becoming known, and in a way she would probably never fully understand for all of her life on earth, it was already being taken from her. Sister Jean's charism had attracted the attention of a young priest named Father Lapire. He was present in 1842, when, at the age of 52, Jean Jagan was elected Mother Superior of the fledgling Sisters of the Poor. Shortly after her selection, Father nullified the election. Eight years later, in 1850, he had a plaque placed outside of the apartment where it had all begun. Among other things, the plaque read, Here, Father Lapire, founder of the Congregation of Little Sisters of the Poor, began his work by helping a poor blind woman. God's love was planted deep in Sister Jean. She sought only to become littler so that Christ himself might be seen in her service to the poor. In this, she sought the heart of our Blessed Mother. And because of this, her spirituality was deeply attractive to young women seeking a path to holiness through self-giving to the poor. In the course of 14 short years, the work grew to 500 little sisters and 36 houses. The simplest and most obvious truths of life are often the hardest to live. People are attracted to love. God attracted the world to himself through the perfect love of the mother of God, the resulting 
redemptive grace of the second person of the blessed trinity become man and the total self-giving of saint joseph their protector the love of the holy family was the strong foundation of love within sister jean she once told a young novice see how jesus mary and joseph loved one another all three how happy they were with what kindness and gentleness they spoke to each other. In our little family, it must be the same. Unless a seed. For all she had accomplished, God still had a work unknown. As is true of all prophecy, God does not reveal the counsels of the Holy Trinity. We don't understand his ways, but he always prepares us for his actions. And he had prepared John Jugan, the one he loved deeply. She had learned to rest in him, to disappear into his sacrificial love. She once said, do not call me John Jugan. All that is left of her is Sister Mary of the Cross, unworthy though she is of that holy name. In 1852, at the age of 62, 
and with many potentially productive years still before her, Sister Mary of the Cross was instructed by Father Lapire to cease all begging and break contact with all benefactors. Four years later, he instructed her to retire to the Order's new mother house, La Tour St. Joseph, where she would remain hidden in obscurity amidst the novices and postulants until her death. Without objection, and apparently with joy, she obeyed. Another work, yet unknown, was about to begin. What to the world seems failure is often God's way of achieving his deeper purposes. What to the world seems humiliation was to Jean Jugan God's greatest gift to her, the opportunity to become little to the point of obscurity. To the objective historian, it would seem impossible that Jean Jugan could become forgotten, even within the order which only 14 years earlier she herself had founded but God had accomplished it. He had won his beautiful virgin bride, Jeanne Jugan, to himself. She was relegated to service among the novices and postulants. Only once, in 23 years of seclusion, was she acknowledged for her founding work. She was never invited to leadership meetings or to conferences. She became truly little, living a life of joy with her beloved. And in this time of service to novices aspiring to become little sisters of the poor, she became their humble teacher. She told them, Jesus is waiting for you in the chapel. Go to him when your strength and patience are giving out, when you feel lonely and exhausted. Say to him, you know well what is happening, my dear Jesus. I have only you. Come to my aid. And then go on your way. And do not worry about how you're going to manage. It is enough that you have told our dear Lord. He has an excellent memory. And she said, Say the Hail Mary. The Hail Mary will take us to heaven.
and God kept his promise to his beloved. On August 28, 1879, Sister Mary of the Cross was 86 years of age when, in obscurity and hidden in the arms of Christ, Jesus took his littlest sister to himself. He joined her death with his in order that she might taste of his immortality. Our God makes all crooked ways straight. Jean Jugan's desire to be little was achieved in her life. In her death, the God of truth and mercy corrected the records of men. In 1890, 11 years following the death of Sister Mary of the Cross, Father Lapire was relieved of his services to the Little Sisters of the Poor. His replacement conducted an investigation into the origins of the congregation. The conclusion was drawn that Jean Jugan was indeed the true foundress of the Little Sisters of the Poor. The history was now righted. Ninety-two years later, Pope John Paul II declared Jean Jugan blessed. In his remarks, he noted that aspects of her work are still hidden, still unknown still to be discovered. He said, John Jugan has given us an apostolic message most relevant to our day. She was granted prophetic intuition into the desires and the needs of the elderly, their desire to be esteemed, respected, and loved, their fear of loneliness, and at the same time, a certain wish for independence and privacy, their longing to be sure their lives are still of use, and very often, a strong desire to deepen their faith and to grow it 
all the more. This is our call today to continue the work of Jean Jugan, to accomplish that which is still hidden, still unknown. She said, when you are old, you will no longer see anything. As for me, I no longer see anything but the good God. John Chagon, you gave your all to Jesus. From the day you took him in, you witnessed to the power of his love. Through poverty and obedience, you trusted so On October 11, 2009, 
the church on earth officially recognized that which God had already declared in heaven, the unique sanctity and charism of Saint Jean Jugan, her feast day to be celebrated each August 30th thereafter. Today, life in the Little Sisters of the Poor on the northern borders of Indianapolis is life in the parish of St. Augustine's home for the aged. At 2345 West 86th Street, the residents are in most ways indistinguishable from you and me. The difference is that they have been touched by years and by the ministry of St. John Jugan. And all of them would say, this is now my home. If the walls of this special place could speak, we would hear a chorus of voices shouting, we saw Jean Jugan today. She greeted us with a kind smile, and we called out to her, Sister John, do our work properly for us. Collect for us. Good evening. I am Father John Duncan, the resident chaplain of the St. Augustine home in Indianapolis. I would like you, if you would please at this point, to join me in prayer. Holy Father, Almighty God, our Father God, you sent your Son Jesus among us to inform us of your love, to show us your love in our salvation. We ask you, Father, to bless the little sisters, not only at the St. Augustine home, but at the other 30 homes which they conduct in this country, and the many other homes which they conduct all over the world for the service of the elderly. 
We pray particularly for the benefactors of the Little Sisters of the Poor, those who assist them as volunteers. We pray especially for those women who are preparing as postulants and novices to continue the charism, to continue the work of St. John Jagan. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. And may he bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may God bless you all. Please stand if you're able and join us in singing for all the saints. Thank you. 